was like, the math ain't mathing. I was like, <laughs> something's not lining up. Hello, team, and welcome to Bureaucracy. I'm your host, Emily Gross. We have a very exciting episode today. I have Travis Broadbeck with me, who happens to be the Associate Director of Data Management and a lecturer at Siena College, and we're going to be talking about the polls in the presidential election. Travis, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. So time's a ticking. Uh, we are nearing we are nearing November 5th. Um, before we dive into this exciting courtesy conversation, what are you drinking? Today, I'm drinking uh, nice mint tea. Uh, it's perfect for the New York weather. Last week, it was 50 degrees. Now, it's 75. So uh, your allergies and all the germs in a, working at the college campus, uh, tea is going to be the beverage of choice tonight. We love that. I'm also drinking an iced tea, um, and I have been sneezing just consistently because of the allergies from New York. So it's been good. Anyways, cheers. Well, cheers. <laughs> all right. So the New York Times Siena College poll is ranked as one of the best um, and would love you could just give an overview as to where things stand in the presidential election so far. Um, and what the polls are saying. Absolutely. So I will preface it with the the uh, most important words of it is close. Uh, in the essence yeah. that whether you look at the, the national uh, polls or if you look at the state-by-state -state battleground polls, you'll see quite a bit of races that are coming within the margin of error. And what that basically says to us is when a poll falls within the margin of error, when both candidates are within two or three percentage points, that when we actually see election day, that the outcome could be either in either direction. So, for example, uh, let's say there's a poll that comes out uh, today that says Harris is up over Trump. 48% over 47 with some uh, undecided voters there. And the margin of error is three percentage points. Well, right there, you would see that technically Harris can be as low as 45%. And as high as 51%, and the same with mm. Trump on both sides there. So what, no matter what poll you look at across all the different methodologies, the different types of pollsters, partisan, nonpartisan, uh, you're, you're seeing that over and over again, uh, that there is a very tight race. And as we know in the United States, the national popular vote does not get you into the White House. Uh, and right. that's where everyone's focus is in. So I, I, I encourage people to really look at the battleground states. And the ones that most people are looking at are going to be North Carolina, Pennsylvania, uh, Michigan, and Wisconsin. Um, then you also have the Sun Belt, where you have Arizona, Nevada, and Georgia. So these are going to be very interesting races. So what, what are we finding right now? Well, you can go to different polling averages to get a better view of all the polls happening in the space, uh, or you can go to your specific pollster, whatever makes you happy. So for example, 538, uh, which is one of the poll aggregators, the one the one that names uh, Siena College New York Times poll the most accurate in America mm -hmm. in 2022 and 2023, uh, they are right now showing that Harris has a 1.8 percentage point advantage over Trump in the U.S. national vote. And But on the other side of that, they're showing that Trump has a slight lead when it comes to the battleground vote uh, uh, where it comes to the electoral college. I did see that. And I was like, the math ain't mathing. I was like, something's not lining up. Yeah. And yeah. that's that's the challenge for voters to, to try to understand that, especially when they're being berated with headline after headline, who's up, who's down, and the different methodologies there. But overall, what you're going to see is on election day, we're not going to know who won. It's going to be a couple of days later, unless unless we uh, see very different outcomes in voter turnout that are not seen in previous uh, election seasons. We are going to anticipate some someone we saw in, similar in 2020, where a couple states will still be counting the ballots one county by county, uh, and then there's going to be a chance for some recounts. So I will say that it is very close, and uh, whether whoever you're rooting for, you're going to be at the edge of your seat. Yeah. So what is the New York Times Siena College most recent data? showing who's yeah, winning so, yeah so <laughs> if you look at um our most recent national poll we do have harris up on the national side uh but mm -hmm. if you look at the across of our, our couple of different states here uh i'll pull up um montana uh which is an interesting race where even though republicans are leading there the interest there for democrats will be the senate race mm -hmm. uh can can the senator uh hold can john on to tester save 
can save a seat. Yep. Yeah. Um, other things that, that we're looking at is Pennsylvania. So Harris is right now leading in Pennsylvania in our most recent poll. And that's one of the most important when you think about the electoral college. Mm-hmm. Uh, basically, the, the commentators and the math comes out to be that if Pennsylvania falls, Harris almost has no shot at winning the election. But on the flip side, we look at North Carolina, where we where it's just within a few, few, few uh, percentage points once again. And this would be actually a rarity if Democrats take uh, North Carolina. Carolina. It doesn't happen that often. And this would be a, a one of those October surprises, uh, as yeah. the terminology used to go. I would say we've had so many October surprises. So that... many surprises. Every day is a surprise. <laughs> Yes. It's actually, on that point, just on a wee bit of a tangent, I was uh, yeah. on vacation in St. Martin, uh, and it was a nice Sunday afternoon. The beach was beautiful, and my phone started vibrating and vibrating and vibrating. And I was like, what What could it be? It could mm-hmm. be nothing that important. And I saw that Joe Biden dropped out of the race. Yeah. And that really changed the game for all of us. And that actually uh, led to a lot of different changes in, in the polls since that moment. Oh, would love to. I want to finish the conversation about like Absolutely. where people are at, where the numbers are at for the um, Senate, you know, for the House, right, and for the president within the battleground states. But then would love to dive into that because that sounds fascinating. Absolutely. So, yeah. So what are the more specific battleground states showing, like Arizona, Georgia, Michigan? Where are those at? Yeah. And if you look at just the New York Times Siena poll versus some other pollsters, you're going to see some slightly different numbers. And I I will tell you that uh, we are about to do seven more of the states. So the results that you've seen uh, in the last couple of weeks, uh, we we are what we've seen, at least in a a lot of our polls, is very similar numbers over and over again, uh, where you see that Harris is leading in what we call the Rust Belt in the northern states, where you see Wisconsin. Harris has a pretty comfortable lead. Michigan, it's pretty close. Uh, It's uh, within a few percentage points there. And then you have uh, the Sun Belt, Arizona and Nevada are the states are leaning more towards Trump along with Georgia. So what we're seeing here is, you know, will the North, you know, stay with Harris again with Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan, uh, and will the the Southern states, the Sun Belt, uh, Arizona, Nevada, and Georgia, and with a little bit of North Carolina in there, uh, what what will happen there? So we're seeing that right now on on the battleground states, it's it's going to be incredibly close, as I mentioned before. <laughs> I wish Yay! I wish I'd give you a better answer that there's a landslide uh, vote there or a poll, but unfortunately, yeah. that that doesn't make a good good news stories. No, and it doesn't make a good podcast either. So you know, everyone's going to be on the edge of their seat, and you know, hopefully, drinking real beer. But we're being responsible in the midday. So, anyways, I'm pretending this is just straight vodka <laughs> or Long Island iced tea, actually. <laughs> but. So then, obviously, the presidential race is very important, but it, it's not everything that's happening and everything that people are voting for. We have to talk about the Senate. We have to talk about the House. There's some very hotly contested races happening in the Senate, um, you know, going to be very close. Based on the polling that's been happening, where do you think the Senate and the House are going to lie? Absolutely. I'm seeing what appears to be voters might be a split ticket voted in where they go ahead and choose one candidate at the presidential level, but then at their congressional and state level, they are choosing different candidates for many different reasons, whether it's econ- uh, economics, abortion, whatever the issue that is most important to them. So what we're seeing, and I will fully disclaim that the New York Times Siena poll has not done many congressional district races in this cycle. 2018, we did uh, 95 polls in the span of 64 days, all in congressional uh, uh, districts. In this recent cycle, we've taken a step back and been focused more on the battleground and the the, the national politics. But what, what you're seeing in the poll aggregators and across the, the districts is Democrats have a slight advantage to take the House, uh, but it won't be a major, or at least right now, it looks like it won't be a major uh, swing in the House. It'll be similar to the four to five seat margin. On the Senate side, we're seeing that there's this this very difficult um, uh, conversion in which the outcome of the presidential race will also de- determine uh, the makeup of the Senate. When you think about Senator uh, Vance, who is uh, of Ohio, 
Uh, so that also cr creates another variable into the mix. But we're seeing that right now there's a chance that the Republicans may have 51 seats in the Senate and the, and the Democrats will have 48 to 49 seats, uh, depending on some of the independent voters who caucus. So one of the examples that we know that Democrats will most likely not win, uh, will, at least for the Senate at that case, is going to be uh, Senator Joe Manchin's uh, seat in West Virginia. Uh, that is basically considered to be a, a Republican lean or a uh, Republican race at this point. Yeah. He's been trying, you know, just crawling over and over and over to the middle and be like, keep me. And it's just not flying. <laughs> He's, you know, still associating him as a Democrat. And so, okay, would love to dive into what is, how do you conduct the polls? You know, what are you guys doing? And then also you mentioned partisan versus nonpartisan polls. You would think that all polls would be nonpartisan. Could you explain? <laughs> Absolutely. I'll start with your second question and I'll, and I'll blend right into the first one. So what is the difference between a partisan poll and a nonpartisan poll? Generally, it comes with who is funding the, the uh, poll and what is their overall agenda. So every campaign has their own uh, partisan pollsters who are trying to identify the weak points of the candidate and also those opportunities to expand uh, their bases. And here at Siena College, we are a nonpartisan pollster, which means no matter what type of race it is as low as to the local city council, mayor's race, we do not work for any candidates. Typically, we either uh, fund the research out of our own pocket or we try to partner with a media partner who once again is someone who doesn't really have a stake in the race, who is more trying to uh, inform the public of what is the current snapshot of the race. So uh, when you do see nonpartisan polls and partisan polls, I encourage folks to try to look at the settings on these poll aggregators. We mentioned 538 as one of them. Uh, Real Clear Poland is another good one. Uh, you also have the New York Times has their own Poland average as well, where they aggregate uh, many of the select pollsters. And the benefit of understanding that is you try to understand the bias and the bias can creep in in many different areas of of the of the research. So starting with your uh, your questionnaire, how you want to ask questions, the words you choose, the adjectives you include, uh, for example, uh, um, this is just a made up example of a push poll, uh, one of the most examples of a partisan poll where they try to uh, force voters or try to trick voters to kind of lean into a certain direction. Uh, would you vote for the corrupt Mayor uh, Eric Adams, who was just in, in indicted on uh, federal charges of bribery and corruption? Uh, or would you vote for the nice, uh, uh, loving Republican candidate uh, who is going to save the world? You know, that would be an example of a partisan poll. And understanding that the word in matters, the also question order matters. So if you ask about, for example, Joe Biden's uh, performance on uh, immigration, on abortion, and then you ask about the horse race uh, or, you know, which candidate would you vote for at the end of the day, if the election were held today, you've already gotten voters all riled up about the issues that they're most passionate about. So you can see some stewage, uh, stewing in, in, the, in the results there. And another thing is how you ask the question. So when we ask the head-to-head -head horse race, would you vote for Vice President Harris or former President Trump, the order of which candidate you vote for matters. So what we do in our polls uh, as a nonpartisan pollster is we randomize the order. So every respondent who answers the phone and when they're asked that question could either get uh, Donald Trump first or Vice President Harris first in that rotation. So those are going to be the keys when you think about question design, but then it even goes deeper into uh, the sample that they want to draw. So, and I can get into very, very detail uh, uh, of what type of samples are out there, but in a high level perspective, sometimes uh, pollsters will try to over, over sample a certain demographic group that they think will either be key to the election, whether that is true or not. So that who you talk to will impact your results. And then lastly is how you uh, weight or adjust your data statistically. And the reason I say weight in it is because when we draw a sample, whether we do it over the phone, online, if we use mailers, whatever it is, you're never going to get the perfect sample. And when I say the perfect sample is when the folks that you talk to have the same demographic composition as the U.S. electorate uh, when you look into the census or other or other types of uh, demographic data. So how much you weight that is, is really important. 
And that goes into this last thing of turnout models. And when a lot of these pollsters are going out there and putting out the results, they have this idea of what the electorate might look like on election day. I don't know, Emily, if you have a, a crystal ball, I totally don't, but I have no idea who's going to show up on election day. I don't know what storms will get in the way. I don't know what family drama will get in the way. Uh, I don't know if my car is going to break down. Uh, so w depending on what state you live in, early voting might uh, change those turnout models. Um, we're seeing differences in partisan uh, of voter turnout on early voting already, and that will... Uh, that will more uh, further inform what we'll see in the next couple of days. So that's just the high level view of, you know, the, the impacts of partisan and nonpartisan uh, uh, pollsters. So what about the Siena College New York Times poll? Well, we are, uh, let me take you back into a little time for a moment, just to explain uh, how this actually became about. So prior to 2016, if, if a pollster was calling off the state voter file, uh, the voter registration list, they were seen, they were seemed to be crazy. They were seemed to be actually cherry picking uh, their sample. Prior to 2016, the traditional way of polling was this for form of random digit dialing, and online polls were just starting to take off at that point. But random digit dialing is the idea that you dial all the possible phone numbers in a geographic area based on the area code and the possible combinations after that. And whoever you get on the phone, you start asking them, are you registered to vote? Uh, how likely are you to vote? And you start going to your questionnaire. One, that is very expensive, but two, you find yourself talking to a lot of voters who are not likely to vote. And there is a little bit of social desirability bias because in, in you know, civics school and civics class, when you're in elementary school and high school, you're told that you know, every citizen is engaged, they, they go out and vote. So there's a little bit of social desirability bias when you say how likely are you going to ask someone how likely to vote. So right. in 2016, we partnered with Nate Cohn, uh, who is one of the chief political analysts at the New York Times, and we actually brought out registration-based sampling, where we actually call voters off the voter file, and that has a, a couple benefits. One, we know that they're already registered to vote, and when you're paying people by the hour to work in a call center and, and dial phone numbers, and just just for a quick uh, you know, scenario, how many people answer the phone? Not many, so be fully transparent. So we call them over and over again until they finally say, why are you calling me? Um, yeah. uh, you know, but we are now calling uh, people, trying to be a little bit more cost effective. But the other benefit of calling off the voter file is we know what elections they participated in. So we actually have his, historical vote outcomes, uh, um, the vote propensity. And that's important because we actually m merge that with the questions that we ask of how likely are you to vote on a scale of 1 to 10? How, how would you rate your chances of voting on Election Day uh, or early voting in that case? So by, by blending their historical vote choice and what they say they're going to, uh, their likeliness to vote, we're able to create this likely voter mo model, which allows us to get a better read and at least have what we believe is the most accurate way to predict uh, or to take a snapshot in time today of where the, uh, the electorate is and what, what election day could look like. So that is the key there. But there's a couple of things that we do beyond just that likely voter mile. Um, one thing is we are 100% telephone shop. Uh, we've been that way for many years, and we still believe that is the gold standard of research. There's very good, high-quality high online panels now, probability panels, but those take many years to form, and the attrition rate is pretty high. And the way that that works is Pew Research is one of the organizations that does a really good um, high, a probability panel where they actually send out postcards or letters with a financial incentive in them and saying, hey, we would like you to join our panel and take surveys with us for the next year or so. Uh, so there's a $5 uh, bill in the envelope. The voter says, all right, I'll sign up. You already know a little bit about me. And they actually find that taking the service is pretty enjoyable. And so by you have these online probability panels, which are basically the gold standard of online re research. And then you have some pollsters that are using non-probability panels. So think about more or less, you put an ad on Facebook saying, take your poll, and you get what you get, uh, which is, that's the, the concern about non-probability panels is quality. And something that's kind of weird about non-probability panels that most people are not uh, thinking about is there is a financial incentive uh, in non-probability panels. Usually you get paid maybe a dollar, maybe some kind of point system. And we found in, uh, in our own testing of non-probability panels that there's some weird behaviors that you might find in the, in the greater marketplace. There's actually what we, we call survey taking farms. Imagine an entire call center of people who are looking for these incentive, uh, incentive based uh, uh, surveys that have no barrier to entry. All you have to do is have an email address and a name. And they're, they're taking multiple the same survey multiple times under different identities. Uh, and so what 
what way we do what we have done in our research with these nonprofit panels. Uh, yeah, it's actually kind of fascinating yeah. um, in the respect of all the things people will do to try to you know beat the system. Um, but right. we upholsters have to think think ahead, um, but also learn from when we see our data doesn't look right. And uh, some things that we do, you know, the pollsters in general do are attention check questions. Uh, if you're reading reading this and not speeding through it, uh, please select this answer or which the following is most logical. Um, and we try to randomize those questions. So even if they have a whole call center of people there, uh, you know, they, they can't catch on that quickly. But we don't do that. But I, I call that out to understand that there's so many methodologies out there. And then we have uh, the uh, what I call the uh, make the soup uh, approach where you have a little bit of online panel, and maybe a little bit of text to web where you send people a text message with a link to take the survey, which is, I would say, second tier to live telephone interviewing. And then you also have uh, maybe some address-based sample involved there too. So these mixed uh, soup or multiple ingredients, the salad of respondents, however you want to kind of frame it or think about it, uh, these methodologies are relatively new and they have some strengths where they get to reach voters or if you were just talking about residents in different kind of demographic groups, you know, meet people where they're at. But it also has the challenge of, you know, which one of these is the most accurate and how do the, in, you know, the interactions of these different modes actually skew your results? Interesting. My question for you, though, is like doing a phone, an only phone based model. You know, I'm Gen Z. We don't love talking on the phone. How do you get that sample and get them to be part of the polling? As I mentioned, we call off the registration uh, file or the uh, registration-based sampling, the voter file. So one thing we do is we do stratified sampling um, and random stratified sampling on that. So what we do is we we pull a list of phone numbers. Let's call it 60,000 phone numbers that we want to call in a certain state. And we make sure that we have way more phone numbers of young people, way more uh, phone numbers mm -hmm. of less college educated folks, people who are less likely to partic participate in polls because their opinion matters. And a lot of people think about 2016, you know, the big miss. Uh, yeah. We want to make sure that we can uh, correct for that. So it starts with your list of phone numbers you're going to call off of. Make sure you over select people who are less likely to participate. The next thing we do is we set strict demographic quotas. And I'm not just saying we're looking for uh, 500 Democrats and 500 Republicans and 200 independents. I'm thinking about we're looking for this many Democrats who are of this race inside of this uh, small region of the state, uh, this mm -hmm. many independents of this race in the small region of the state. And many times we have between 20 to up to 40 different demographic, uh, demographic qu uh, quotas that we're trying to fill. And the way the reason we're doing that is we want to make sure we get a purely representative sample. We don't we don't want to just get anybody. We want to get the right folks in our in our, our sample. So first we do stratified sampling. We set strict demographic quotas, and then we focus a lot on callbacks. And we have interviewers that are bilingual, so we actually do interviews in both English and Spanish. And many times, especially when we try to to get a read on the Hispanic uh, on a Hispanic heavy state, or maybe we do an oversample in the nation, we actually make sure that the first First call made by our uh, two Hispanic flag respondents are made by Spanish speakers. So immediately they can jump right into the interview uh, and conduct that interview in the language that is preferred there. And so the other thing with the callbacks is we want to make sure that if someone does not respond to a poll, we call them at least three, maybe four, maybe five times in the field and period that we have because oh, we want to make sure. They must love you guys. <laughs> they and must love you. <laughs> And the, the scary part is we're not the only ones doing that. You have oh every, God. think about the battleground states. The states are going to determine the election. We have Quinnipiac calling. You have Emerson College calling. You have Mayor's College calling. You have the partisan pollsters. You have the Siena College poll calling. And we're all beating these voters up. And they've already said, I've already taken your survey. You're like, nope, you have not. But that was someone else's. So are you ready to participate? I have never been so glad to live in New York in my life. I, do. I am never moving to a battleground state ever. Well, wait wait for the governor's race. We might call you. Oh, God. All right. Or maybe you might get a text message or uh, an online uh, invitation to take a survey. All right. I'm probably one of those people that will only respond for an incentive, I'll be honest. <laughs> and that's why you have, the, you have the polls that do the MITS method approach right. to ensure that you're included. Um, Thank you. <laughs> but one other thing after we we, we do the, the call bats, we do the stratified sample, we do the demographic uh, quotas, we also have to weight our data as well. And 
again, we have the benefit of the voter file and we look back to pre previous elections. We look at our data county by county in our results and compare it to previous historical records to see, is there a chance that there's a sample and miss, you know, sample and bias? Uh, in previous elections, you heard about the idea of the shy Trumper where folks would get on the phone and either tell you they're undecided or tell you they're going to vote for the Democrat. And then you see a overwhelming majority of folks who actually vote for um, D Donald Trump in the example. So we make sure we weight the data to, to try to be as accurate as possible, but we also are super sensitive to this idea of design effect, where uh, we, we kind of set a threshold where we don't want to weight our data to beyond a certain point, because then at that point, we're actually giving people too much emphasis. So for folks who are underrepresented in the poll, they count for too many respondents, and people for overrepresented in the poll, they count as too few respondents. So that's where weighting does, where, for example, Let's say we got a sample of 55% female and 45% male. What we do is we try to adjust that all the samples so it becomes down to 51 female and 49 male. So females count a little less than one and men count a little more than one. And we were really sensitive to, to the size of the weights there. Uh, and if we find that the, the weights are too large, we have to make some decisions. And usually the, the most simple decision is we have to go back into the field. Uh, our, our sample isn't representative enough uh, because we're, we're weighting it too much. Well, this uh, is my question then leading into... <clears throat> understanding that information. After Joe Biden dropped out of the race and Kamala Harris became a nominee, she got a boost, you know, yes. and Joe Biden was low and then Kamala Harris came up. And then over the past, what has it been, two months, it's been decreasing her mm -hmm. boost, you know, and it's gotten very, very, um, it's a tie, right? Kind of almost to where it was before Biden dropped out. Mm -hmm. um, is the boost that she got, do you think that was overweighting sampling error or do you think the actual polling was correct and accurate and just her, for whatever reason she's decreased i'm more leaning to the second option and mm. the reason that is you're, you're speaking about the sugar high uh, the post invention yeah. bump the post announcement bump and i would say that, that that's actually probably more a artifact of democratic enthusiasm uh to respond to polls so even mm. we, t we talk about uh you're trying to get the right number of democrats right number of independents right number of republicans you might get the right number of republicans but they might be more harris leaning republicans more likely to talk to somebody because they were kind of putting their head down. They were Nikki Haley voters before Donald J. Trump became the, the nominee and they didn't really want to participate. Now that they have a new candidate there, they're like, I'm energized again. I'm more likely to participate in the polls. Another thing that we're seeing that is challenging and some of the New York Times Siena poll doesn't do is, and this is challenging when you try to look back, is waiting by the last election. So a lot of pollsters for whether they think that their sample is inaccurate or that they're just uh, have a little bit of trauma from 2016 and 2020, uh, they're actually going ahead and saying, well, uh, they ask a question in the poll saying, who did you vote for in the 2020 election? Was it Joe Biden, Donald Trump, or did you not vote? And generally, that question has always been stewed for decades of survey research, where people either forget who they voted for, or they're more likely to overstate that they voted for the winner because they don't, they're embarrassed to say they voted for you know, the person who lost or, or what have you. Um, you know, that, that, that question has historically been found to be a little bit problematic. But pollsters are using it to adjust their samples after they collect it, which in, when you think about it, it actually gives the loser of the last election and an, an advantage. We're actually overstating their support. We're actually trying to measure, uh, trying to adjust our sample to kind of mimic that. So we're seeing a lot polls to be a lot more closer, and we it's hard to suss out, especially depending on the transparency of, of pollsters, is it because of the sample they collected, or is it because of the turnout model and the weighted parameters that they're using? So it's been difficult, but we did find that in our own polls, uh, when you look at the response rates of Democrats and the left-leaning um, uh, Republicans and independents, they were just way more likely to answer on the first or second call than the folks who are ardent Trump uh, voters. And one thing I always say is you can't quota by vote choice. Uh, as much as you want to, you, you really can't because no one knows what the, what the true outcome is. Uh, so we have to vote by, you know, we have to quota by the, the variables or the demographics that we're very aware of, uh, that we have data to support. Interesting. So in the last two weeks, what should voters keep in mind when they see all the polls coming in? Absolutely. Well, I think that the first thing is, you know, 
a lot of the commentators will tell you there's no such thing as an October surprise. I got to see Donald uh, Trump, um, you know, hand out French fries at McDonald's. Maybe there is an October surprise. Uh, yeah. Maybe maybe these uh, the Joe Rogan uh, interview will hit. Uh, differently with um, people. Maybe the town hall with CNN will will be uh, big. Maybe there'll be a hot mic incident. So there are plenty of things that can happen. Uh, we see the court uh, battles uh, continue to p- press on. Uh, that seems to have not a huge effect on, on the voters, but it may actually be the thing that might sway those undecided voters. In our most recent national poll, we still found that 12% of our voters are undecided. So uh, they're still holding their breath and maybe they'll hold their nose and just choose any, meeny, miny, mo <laughs> when they get to the polls or maybe they won't even show up at all. Uh, so yeah. that is going to be the thing that I just want to caution anybody is surprises still happen. We have no idea who's going to show up. But what demographics should you look at or what, what major issues? Well, I will say that foreign policy, even though it's not a huge thing for voters, uh, younger voters are a little bit more sensitive to the amount of issues when you think about the environment, but also when you think about global conflict. Uh, we're seeing quite a bit of conflicts that are happening both in um, Africa, in the Middle East, in Europe, and uh, also this, this movement with uh, North Korea and Russia. So foreign policy might be a thing that might be that last minute surprise. Disinformation campaigns, uh, what we saw, for example, in the hurricane uh, in the South hit, a lot of these posts um, saying that uh, resources are being diverted to help um, um, immigrants in, in uh, other states. Maybe you know that that is going to have an impact. But demographically wise, when we look at the polls, here's the groups that I, I think that we should all focus on. One, there's a major gender gap uh, when we look between men and, and females. So uh, women are more likely to, to support Vice, uh, Vice President Harris. In our most recent uh, national poll here, it, uh, Harris actually is, is leading women by 16 points. That's wow. eight points better than Biden did back all the way in July, right before he dropped out. Uh, so Harris has actually gained even more inroads with female voters than, than uh, they did before. And uh, one of the, the, strong, the strengths of uh, Republicans are the, the idea of the suburban, suburban women. Uh, where will they find themselves with abortion essentially on the ballot as a referendum uh, where this country should go? Another thing you look at men, I mentioned Joe Rogan in a lot of these podcasts. Uh, you look at the economic condition of the nation. Most people rate it as poor. Uh, so where will men find? Right now, they are leaning towards Trump. Uh, the most recent measurement we have is Trump has 11-point advantage with men. But then you have to look at not, uh, non-white voters. Uh, black voters is, is particularly the interest uh, where the, the, the narrative is, Can did the Biden coalition maintain or did it fall apart since then? Right now, we're seeing almost the same uh, share of voters supporting uh, Harris uh, uh, or, or black voters supporting Harris as they supported Biden in July. So a 63 point advantage. But still, 35 points uh, uh, towards Trump is a relatively large shift from what we've seen in previous elections. So that will be key. Will this demographic um, come out and vote? Maybe it's actually the intersection of black men versus black women. And the other thing is to look at our Hispanic and uh, independent and Republican voters. So uh, I will tell you, Hispanic voters are not a monolith and none of the demographic groups are. But unfortunately, we have to put people in buckets when we do cross tabs. Uh, but there are ver- there's major differences in the type of Hispanic voters. So your Cuban Hispanic is different from your Mexican Hispanic uh, versus your California Hispanic. So you're going to see differences there in, in the policy issues that they, uh, they force on. At the end of the day, most Democrats are going to vote for the Democratic candidate, most Republicans are going to vote for the Republican candidate, and your independents are going to be the ones who are going to decide. And right now, Trump has just a one-point advantage with independents. So those are the folks who are going to most likely dis- decide the outcome of the election. But I want to call out one thing that is interesting. And I think that Liz Cheney being out there campaigning, the uh, Republicans for Harris is out there, is back in uh, in October or, or in uh, May, we saw that only 3 per, uh, 3% of Republicans were willing to support the Democratic candidate. In our most recent poll, we see 9% of Republicans. Wow. So is there is this attrition from the Republican Party going to be strong enough to maybe push Harris over the edge in the battleground states? Uh, you think about Nikki Haley's territory, will those voters, even though she endorsed a Trump, uh, switch on over to uh, uh, Harris? We'll, we'll only see what happens, but there's a lot of events that will happen in the next you know, 12 or so days. Wow. All right. Travis, you gave us a lot to think about. There's a lot to keep out, keep our eyes on. Um, everyone, it's going to be stressful. Hold on to your seats. <laughs> Have that beer. We're going to get through it. It's going to be okay. 
Travis, thank you so much for providing so much insight and sharing what's such an important part of the political process and the way we discuss things. Um, and great way for people to, you know, keep new stuff in mind. So thank you. Well, Emily, thank you for doing this. I, I'm glad you're able to kind of take such a topic that people are afraid to talk about now. They put their fingers in their ears and they say, la, 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 la. Uh, you know, this is this is what I'm looking forward to in the future. I'm looking forward to going back to a time where we can discuss differences in political opinion, uh, but be happy about it and be able to kind of cheers at the end of the discussion and say, that was a great debate. Uh, I'm looking forward to those days and we're currently not living in them, at least in my, my perspective. No. <laughs> Maybe one day. <laughs> Maybe. Anyways, Travis, thank you so much. I'm your host, Emily Gross. We'll be back next week with another episode of Bureaucracy.